Oh, that's right. We're on this side. What's that? God, look at Kathy's yeah. shoes. Hello, and welcome to the Historic Preservation Commission meeting of Thursday, January January 21st, 2016. The time is 5 o'clock. May we have roll call, please? Sure. Commissioner Morgan? Here. Commissioner Shire? Here. Commissioner Vartanian? Here. And Commissioner Vitor? Here. Thank you all present. Thank you. Item number two on the agenda is um, commission chair vote to determine commission chair and vice chair who will each serve a term of one calendar year per commission rotation policy. And um, Jay, am, am I safe in, in assuming we're going to take nominations take and nomination. a second and do a vote? And second. Okay. Mm -hmm. So do we have uh, a nomination for, and we'll do chair and vice chair together? Or, Why yeah, not? do we have... Nominations for chair and vice chair? Well, I would nominate Arlene Vidor for chair and for vice chair, um, Desiree. Is there okay. a second? I'll second. Okay, and can we have roll call, please? Sure. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Shire? Yes. Commissioner Vartanian? Yes. And Commissioner Vidor. Yes. Thank you. Motion to approve the chairperson. And now is Vidor. Now's the time when we actually get up and Musical switch chairs. chairs. <laughs> Musical name tags, don't forget. Uh, yes. the posting of the agenda? No. Not yet. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your service, former Chair Chair Emeritus Vartanian. Thank you. Thank you for joining me in this responsibility. Um, the agenda for this meeting was posted on or before Monday, January 18th, 2016, on the bulletin board outside of City Hall. And we will go on to approval of the minutes from the November meeting. Do we have um, any additions or corrections? I have one myself. Oh, I have none. Anyone else? Um, on item number five, <coughs> comments from commissioners. Um, I, I don't know of any window change outs in any of the stone houses. I did at one point, and it might have been in November, mention that I thought we should revisit the stone house survey and make sure that uh, properties weren't eroding away and just look at it because it had been over five years but I don't remember uh, any window change out or mention of that yeah, it did it did come up it had been brought up by the Historical Society and maybe we got the wrong commissioner for that does anyone remember <coughs> we can go back to the tape and just clarify that but okay we, we did have a brief discussion about it and then mm. uh, because it you know, it could be an item that comes back. We didn't mm -hmm. talk about it at too much length. So. Obviously, if it's something I did and I don't remember, I shouldn't be the chair of this commission. <laughs> there is something. I, I, I really don't. Already, Desiree. There you go. Already. <laughs> I'm, I'm on the hot seat. Okay, so we'll, we'll verify who, okay. who brought that up. So. Okay. Well, the, the item before talked about window replacement on Mountain, but it wasn't... I don't know that it was related to the survey you were speaking of. No, I only remember a comment about the um, the currency of the survey, yeah, the Stonehouse it, survey. Been brought up by the Historical Society for a house in uh, North Glendale. We'll, we'll just go back and look at no. it. No, okay, sorry. Um, okay, so with that, um, I move to approve the minutes of November nineteenth, twenty fifteen. Do we have a second? I second. Okay, Joe, I'll call. I'll make a note of that. Oh, roll call. Any motion on the table? I'm sorry, I missed that. Yes, yes. I made the motion, and Commissioner Desiree made the second. Yep. Sure, thank you. So we can have a roll call. Commissioner Vartanian? Yes. Commissioner uh, Shire? Yes. Chair Commissioner Morgan? Yes. And uh, Madam Chair Vidor? Yes. Thank you. Motion to approve the minutes. Uh, oral communications. I have one oral communication from uh, Catherine Yuka from the Neodara Drive area. So 
Thank you. Um, congratulations on your appointment. You. Uh, my name is Catherine Yurka, and I'm here on behalf Thank of the you. Glendale Historical Society to announce that we're holding a restoration expo on Sunday, May 15th. Actually, I think it's a Sunday, May 15th, in front of the doctor's house in Brand Park. We're planning demonstrations, workshops, and lectures, as well as having vendors there to showcase their products and talents. This is an ideal activity for Historic Preservation Month, and we urge the HPC and staff to attend and be a presence there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no more oral communications, so do we have any comments from commissioners? Well, I have one simple thing. I would like to encourage the city council, specifically the person who has the vacant seat over there, to nominate someone so that we can have a full commission. It's been almost a year. And I would like to also encourage the Glendale Historical Society to do the same, to kind of encourage the person whose chair is vacant to nominate somebody or to push somebody forward on it. And I would also like to thank the Glendale Historical Society um, Dan Evans, who was the, the uh, editor of the Glendale News Press. When the Glendale News Press moved from Glendale to Los Angeles, they had a whole bunch of volumes of the Glendale News Press from the 1920s until the 19, 2000, I guess. He's leaving the area, and he um, put a thing on Facebook to have somebody come and get the books because he's not taking them with him. And the Glendale Historical Society stepped up and are taking those volumes. And they're, they should stay in Glendale. They're very important. They're very fragile. But I think it's, it's something that just should stay in the area. And I would like to thank them for stepping up and taking them. And be digitized. They are digitized. Oh, yes. And yes. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I have an, an, an announcement if you want to put the slide up. Um, tonight, uh, there will be um, a very nice and relevant film at the Brand Library, co-sponsored by the Brand Associates and the Glendale Historical Society. The film starts at 7. It's called Visual Acoustics, The Modernism of Julius Shulman. Uh, and it's a documentary about the wonderful work of photographer Julius Shulman to characterize all the beautiful mid-century modernism that we have in our region. And we're going to have a special guest, Chris Nichols, uh, preservationist extraordinaire and uh, associate editor of L.A. Magazine, to introduce the film and take questions after the film. So 7 o'clock tonight at the Brand Library. Hope everybody can join us. Great. I'll be there. Yes. <laughs> If I may, it. Yes. I, I just want to quickly thank my um, colleagues and staff for allowing me to chair this commission for the past two years. I'm so happy to pass the baton <laughs> to your capable hands. And um, I also um, was going to um, reach out or, or make mention to, um, I hope Mayor Najarian doesn't mind me um, mentioning his name, but if you're listening, yes, please. Uh, appoint someone to our commission so we can have a five-panel board as we're supposed to, yeah. and um, and uh, city attorney's office is going to also put a little. They recognize the problem with having an even number of commissioners. So. Mm. Right. I mean, it would be yes, nice to have five of us. Though we haven't run into any ties yet, I don't think. We've come so. close. Sorry. Right? We've come close. We've come close. Yeah, we have. We have. Occasionally, we too close do. for comfort. Um, so, yeah, with that, Thank those you. are my comments. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to, we don't have any old business, so we'll move on to new business, which is the proposed Neodrara Drive Historic District to review the petition, requesting designation, and then on to recommendation to City Council. Um, good evening, Commissioners. The Planning Division staff is requesting the Historic Preservation Commission recommend to the City Council uh, that the Neo Dry Drive Historic District overlay zone be established by the City of Glendale. Um, this map shows the um, boundary line um, and it includes 32 properties north of the Verdugo Park. Uh, the Historic um, Resource Survey found that the um, area meets four of the nine criteria for hi historic district designation. Criteria A, which exemplifies or reflects special elements of the city's cultural, social, economic, political, aesthetic, <coughs> engineering, architectural, or natural history. Criterion E 
has a unique location or is a view or vista representing an established and familiar visual feature of a neighborhood community or of the city. Um, it meets criterion G, which reflects significant geographical patterns, including those associated with different eras of settlement and growth, transportation modes, or distinctive examples of park or community planning. And criterion H conveys a sense of historic and architectural cohesiveness through its design, setting, materials, workmanship, or association. The historic resource, resource survey findings are that the period of significance is between 1909 and 1962. Um, a contributor which is built in the period of significance and retains its integrity, um, and a non-contributor which is built outside of the uh, period of significance or has lost its integrity. Um, and what we have in the historic research findings are that 25 out of the 32 homes are contributors, or 78%, and seven homes are non-contributors. Um, our ordinance requires that it's 60% be contributors. And um, the second petition, HPC authorized the second petition uh, requesting designation um, and signatures by the homeowners. Um, they approved that um, circulation on May 21st 20, at the 2015 meeting. Um, it was returned to staff within the six month deadline on November 18th, 2015. Uh, 24 properties have requested uh, district designation and that is 24 out of the 32 for 75%. Um, and our ordinance requires 50%. We have not received any petition opposing um, the designation. Um, so staff, um, in closing, given the number of signatures um, and the commissioner's approval of historic resource findings and the findings that all designation thresholds have been met, planning staff recommends the commission vote that the city council designate the district. On February 3rd, staff will also request that the Planning Commission establish a historic district overlay zone on the boundary area presented. Um, that concludes the formal presentation. Um, you also received uh, copies of seven letters that were received. One additional came today, which is included. So um, at this point, um, Jay, shall we go into oral communications or... Unless you have any questions for staff, you should, yeah. Questions, anyone at this point? Okay. I have five requests for oral communication. I'm sorry, I've shuffled the deck here, so <laughs> if there was an order, it's now out of order. So we'll take Barbara Brown first. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here. Um, I just want to say that uh, just, it's a just, privilege. If you could just state your name. I am Barbara Brown. I uh, live at 1647 Fernbrook Place in Glendale. Optional. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we live in a 1925 home. Would like to first of all thank Kathy for her diligence in this project. She has been amazing. And uh, so I'm in favor. My husband and I are in favor of this historic uh, uh, district. And um, we thank you for listening to us. And I don't know what else to say except that we are in favor of this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel Brotman. Hi there. Uh, Dan Brotman, and I'm at 1641 Fernbrook Place. Uh, I'm the newest neighbor to the area. Uh, moved in about uh, five months ago, I think. Um, one thing that attracted me to the area was that you know, kind of the special character, especially the stone walls that you see, and uh, and the the remnants of the uh, of the uh, the creek and um, the little bridges and things like that. So uh, it's uh, it just makes it makes it feel special. And I just wanted to come here to say that you know I support the plan as well, and I'm excited to see it go ahead. Thank you very much. Okay, Donald Cameron. Yeah, my name is Donald Cameron. I uh, was out of town when they had the first meeting on this, and my one question is, 
what does this have any effect whatsoever on the properties that are adjacent to this? I live uh, on the other side of the alley that runs parallel to Kenyatta Boulevard. Uh, Jay, do you want me to address this, or did you want to address this? Um, I can, if unless you'd rather. Well, we, the, we don't have to address it, these, but but I think it's an oh, interesting question. Okay, questions, no, so. um, the the boundaries are defined in the properties within the district that are part of the defined area are the ones that are impacted by okay. it. Okay, thank you. If you if you leave if you live immediately adjacent to the district, um, there will be regulation based on. Uh, guidelines that we have for historic districts of how the properties in the district will change. Um, there's no promise that they won't change at all, but the changes that will be made will be in keeping with the historic character of the properties for the portions of the property that are visible from the street. If you were to live behind a house in the historic district, it would be similar to living behind any other property in Glendale. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't have any direct effect on you as a district, but changes to an individual property could have an effect on immediate neighbors. That makes sense, which it doesn't look like it does. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, it won't I think what do, do you li do you live right next to the boundary, or you? Live yes. Yes. Yeah. So, do you, does your backyard overlook the backyard of someone in the district, or yes. are you across the street from? No, my backyard it's adjacent. Okay. If you're familiar with the area? There's a, an alleyway that runs. Uh, so you're on the other side. You're on the other side of the alley. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm on the other side of the alley. Yeah, I, I wouldn't expect that anything different would happen here because of the district than could possibly happen anywhere else in the city. But but you can know that development that happens in the district is going to be regulated to make sure that the historic character of that the streets that face into the district are maintained, which may it may or may not affect you directly. So. That's the part I'm not getting. How how <laughs> may or may not how might it. It, it, it will enhance Niadrara Drive, Fernbrook, and parts of Hillside because those, those streets will maintain the character that they have today. So if part of the reason you chose to move into this neighborhood is because you like driving up and down Niadrara Drive, then you'll know that those parts of that part of the neighborhood isn't going to change significantly. Oh, okay. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Catherine? I wrote a little speech, but I've been here before, <laughs> and I'll just say that I'm very excited that this is moving into the final phases. I am so grateful to my neighbors for their enthusiasm and their support, and especially for those who wrote and came in today. It just means a lot to me, and I hope you will support this. It's a great thing for the neighborhood. It's a great thing for Glendale. That's it. Oh, and I'm Catherine Yurka. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank, thank you. We know you had a pivotal role. And we all appreciate your efforts. Uh, John Madden, last speaker. Yes, hello, I'm John Madden. I live on Fernbrook Place in the district. Um, I've lived there for about 10 years. <clears throat> and I think the, distri uh, the district is very important. I'm in, in favor of it. Uh, just in the past 10 years, um, you talked about the number of conforming and non-conforming properties. I believe that Two of the properties that are non-conforming were conforming at the time we moved in 10 years ago. So um, uh, the city has been um, fairly, actually, uh, overly permissive, I think, on permitting people to uh, significantly alter or, um, in some cases, almost tear down the existing historical uh, homes in the area. So I think. Uh, it's a very special area with the West Side Stream and the whole area north of the park, and I think it needs to be preserved. And so I'm looking forward to approval by the city. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can go into the discussion phase now. So, um, are there any comments from? Uh, if we're closing the public hearing, unless um, Jay, um, mm -hmm. we have. We, we can't really take any more comments um, unless you want to. You could you could allow the speaker to speak right. and just ask her to you fill have out another, a card. And another start. comment. You're you're on the you're on the docket already. Very Go quickly, ahead. the most important thing for me to say is that we have been there 48 years, Perfect. and we have seen some changes. So that's very important, and we love the idea of preserving the uniqueness of our area. It's very very cool. So thank you. Okay. 
So do we have any comments uh, from commissioners before we take our vote? Well, I would just like to say thank you again to Catherine Yurka and all the neighbors that come um, arrested behind this because it is an important area. It's very unique to Glendale. It's one of the rare areas that is a kind of a nestled neighborhood with, you know, uh, rocks and streams and beautiful trees. And so um, I fully support the uh, district and I'm glad that you are all excited about it. I think it's one of the districts that has the highest percentage Maybe the highest yet. I'm not sure not if we had one high. higher. Cottage Grove has Cottage the highest. Cottage Grove is going to be hard to beat. Right, so. that's true. <laughs> one non contributor Second right. highest to that. So it just goes to show that the, neighbor, the neighbors are excited about this, and that's, that's good to have that kind of support. And I concur. I also completely support um, the addition of this district to Glendale, and um, thank you all for your hard work, especially Catherine. Um, I think it's been a couple of years maybe a little longer so you can start to exhale a little bit. And, um, yeah, congratulations. I always enjoy driving through the neighborhood and walking sometimes as well, and, and it's preserved now for, you know, the future. So congratulations. I concur the same thing. As a little boy, I used to walk through the neighborhood back when they had the, the water running down the stream there, and um, I'm happy for the simple fact that it will remain the way it is. And, the way it was when I was young 60-some years ago, anyway. Except Thanks. for a little water. Mm. Yes, with some water back then. Maybe bring that right. <laughs> we, we can A large but. rushing stream soon. Um, well, what all of my fellow commissioners said, and certainly thank you all for your diligence, and thank you, Catherine, for all the work you did. And I'm, I'm not a resident of the area, and I know Glendale's a very neighborhoody city, um, and I feel very proud of your neighborhood. I think anything like this that you do for your neighborhood is good for my neighborhood and every other neighborhood in Glendale. So thank you all very much. Um, and if we're ready, we could uh, seek a motion. And if, if you just remember, the motion is to recommend to City Council that the district be designated. I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to recommend that the proposed near Drara Drive Historic District uh, be approved by City Council and fully support this. I second it. Commissioner Shire? Yes. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Vartanian? Yes. Madam Chair Vidor? Yes. Thank you. Voted 4 to 0. To approve. Go out and celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now we move on to item B, which is review of the 2014-15 Certified Local Government Report. Okay, hopefully if you don't have copies of this, I, I was just going to briefly go over. There are a few uh, things that we've changed a little bit uh, from last year. The format of these reports, since I've been preparing them, has pretty much stayed the same. So some of our responses are also kind of boilerplate that explain our processes in Glendale. Mm -hmm. So I was going to just hit a few of the uh, main points. The thing to remember here is their reporting period is strange. It's October 1st through September 30th, so we straddle a year. Huh. So, so in this case, we designated six properties during the reporting period, even though this year we only designated three properties. So... Um, so, but we list we list the properties that were designated. We list things like the Neodrara Drive survey, which was approved by the commission. So, even though the district isn't designated, we acknowledge that we've conducted a survey that's been approved, and identified 32 properties within its boundary. Um, we talk about the uh, pending South Glendale Community Plan. Last year's report talked about the historic context that we prepared for that, which was reviewed and approved by the commission. We didn't have any major news this year because it's kind of an ongoing process, so we're just telling them that we're still continuing that and we expect it to be finished in the next reporting period. Uh, we give them some background on you guys when you were appointed, when your terms end. We acknowledge that we are short a, short a uh, a commissioner and and Shippo is aware of that. The State Preservation Office is aware of that, and they they agree with everyone that we, we should have five people on the commission. Um, we go through your attendance records, and then they can also see when uh, meetings have been canceled. I think to be a CLG, I think you have to have at least four meetings a year. Um, we had I think eight. Uh, what does it look like? Seven last year. So. Uh, we cancel meetings when we need to, but we're still within the requirements there. 
we talk about your trainings and we've recognized over recent years that the commission hasn't been receiving enough training this year is the best ever since we've been doing it because each of you received at least one kind of training session some of them were a little short we can do better at the end of today's hearing i'm going to mention a, a goal that we have for the next several meetings uh, to uh, to do trainings within this setting so it's going to be a public meeting where you'll be looking over a, a, a slide, a series of slideshows prepared by the state office about the Secretary of the Interior standards. So uh, we'll talk more about that. But that will, that will be a big step toward having more formal training, more hours of training for the commission. And then, of course, we're going to hope that you can still attend CPF workshops. OHP sometimes conducts workshops. Um, go to uh, to. Uh, what are they called conferences I think they're called um, whatever whatever else works for you guys but we did certainly want you to take advantage we also raised our membership level in California Preservation Foundation which gives us more freebies and it also gives us more uh, discounted rates for things so you can take advantage of that moving on we talked about the survey um, we also include something uh, about public education. So when, when commissioners make presentations, when staff makes presentations to the public, SHPA wants to recognize that you are out in the community and doing this. Uh, Commissioner Vidor has done a tremendous job, particularly this year, but also in the past, uh, working through TGHS, TGHS's uh, Speakers Bureau. And so you can see a number of presentations given over the year about Glendale Modern, Glendale Lost and Found. You didn't do Glendale Unzipped, I guess, this year. Maybe not. <laughs> I did find another one, though. Mm -hmm. As a rehearsal for the TGHS one, I did Glendale Mod Goes Modern on June 15th. Of this year? Of uh, 2015. Okay, so, yeah, it's so kind we'll of a that. rehearsal, mm -hmm. so you can throw that one in there. Yeah, too. we'll do that for next year's report. Oh, okay. right. so, 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 I, <laughs> so I keep track. So as as you, if there's something that you're doing in the community that I'm not aware of, if you could let me know, I keep a running list of this so that we can fill this out at the end of each year. Commissioner Brotani. No, no. I, I was going to say I I was. Um, it's too late now. I was not aware that this was a portion of it. And um, I also did a presentation. Uh, it's, not, it's not too late. I told. I don't know if it helps to add it. Or yeah, the, the, it doesn't hurt. So I'll um, because I'll we're it. reviewing this. This was this was due um, on January fifteenth. So I already submitted it with the caveat that if anything came up today, I'd give them a revised version. Okay, so, so if it helps, normally you, I'll send you details. Normally, we try to get this done reviewed before in previous years. Maybe that didn't happen, but. Um, but we're definitely going to try to do that, but we canceled December's hearing, so we'll see how it works. But, but oh, let me make a note mm -hmm. about that. So if you could send me an email with that, Commissioner Bertani. No, Bertani. no, that's the one. Yeah, I, I did an, a presentation on how to establish a historic district to the Montrose Verdugo Spar Heights. Uh, yeah, Spar Heights Neighborhood, yeah. Association. Neighborhood Association. Excellent. So those of you who haven't done that, encouragement is mm -hmm. out there. Maybe um, you could put, um, well, oh, you've already submitted it, so. No, like I said, I can, so I can revise it. You can revise it. Oh, well, I, I had a few suggestions, but since we're on the topic of, of these presentations, I, I don't remember that in that section that it was mentioned that, you know, even though we're commissioners and we're speaking, that this is through the TGHS Speakers Bureau, so. I, I, don't, I don't think that's really. Relevant? Of, yeah, it's not. It, it's just that okay. it's more relevant that you're speaking as a as a commissioner to a group of people that don't really have a place to put that. Okay. Yeah. It could, it could be put in there. Yeah. We could we could work on that. Um. Then there's a section that is only for CLGs that have been designated recently, so we don't fall into that category. And then we uh, have a section where we talk about um, what, are, what are the issues uh, of concern in Glendale. And we change this a little bit because, you know, overall, you know, large-scale development is still a concern. How, how are we going to deal with historic issues? Um, one of the things that we're telling SHPO is that the uh, commercial survey will be conducted in 2016. It kept, keeps getting pushed back, but we are now committed to 2016 completion for this, 
and that's going to be a big help in terms of downtown development and development along commercial corridors in terms of identifying potential historic resources. Uh, we talk about our biggest accomplishment. I wasn't sure what to put there this year. I thought, well, we did really improve our educational you know, efforts on behalf of the commission. I was surprised about that. I kind of thought, um, you know, I thought it was a big accomplishment that we decided as a, as a group and then you took it forward to, you know, run it up the chain of command in the different departments that we decided to identify um, and ultimately list city-owned properties on the register and a couple have been done, but, mm -hmm. you know, but this is a commission initiative. Mm -hmm. And that seemed like a really significant I, project. I did include that. The reason I didn't put it there was because we started that before this reporting period. We started it with MSB and then with the Cedar right. House. Right. Yeah, I was thinking we've done I three did, so far. I did include um, it. Well, there's one mention of Wallace House as having been nominated, but it seemed like that was just nominated and there wasn't any special call out of the program. Yeah, no, let me, let me, I, I believe I did call it out though, and I'm having trouble seeing it here. But it is somewhere in this report, no, it's the, and it could, it could be where we talked about the designations. The pro um, properties are mentioned that have been listed. That, that was the only place I All saw right. it. Uh, well, in the Wallace House, yeah, this designation furthers our goal to have more city-owned properties designated. The nomination was produced by HPC Commissioner Gador. Um, I can certainly add that into... I could find a place to kind of highlight it. Like I just didn't think it, it wasn't a new initiative. That's the that's why. It was, initiative. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we look forward to more commission generated uh, nominations. So I'll amend that. Um to date, we haven't really had a, a program to recognize work. We've talked in the past about wouldn't it be nice to have some sort of awards presentation. I believe the Historical Society has been doing that if the commission wanted to be involved in that. For many years, we had so such tiny amount of work happening in districts that we didn't really have any nominations. Now, of course, with money flowing again, we're seeing a lot more work in the districts, and it's something for us to consider. The staff time commitment to a formal kind of plan to kind of take nominations, evaluate nominations, probably isn't going to happen anytime soon. So if, if we were going to have a recognition program, hopefully it could be in conjunction or, or in support of, of the nonprofit's efforts. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure that that's going to change in the next year. Um, we have goals that we uh, provide every year, and then we talk about how we have or have not accomplished the goals. In general, when we're not accomplishing goals, it's because things have just gotten pushed back in time, not that the goal has been eliminated. So that's, that's a long section. If you have any questions, I could answer those. And then we established uh, new goals uh, for 2015-2016, the next reporting period. Uh, one of which would be improving our relationship with the historical society so that we can start uh, kind of seeing eye to eye on more projects or at least understanding where, where differences are and why they're happening. Um, we want all HPC uh, members to complete the three modules of the SHPO Learning uh, Secretary of the Interior Standards. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, we are going to bring the proposal, which has been sitting on the back burner for a while, to enhance the MILSAC program and require reporting on a five-year cycle from property owners. Um, we're committing as best as we can to get that done this year. Um, that goes before city council. That goes to council, yeah. That's an ordinance. It's actually not an ordinance change, but it's a policy change, so we want that to be reviewed in that venue. Um, we are very close. This is pretty exciting. It's not public yet, but we're very close to having our entire survey database public. We now have it available to staff through our internal system. So every single survey that's been conducted going back to the 1980s now has uh, data forms that can be pulled up by staff to recognize when a property is historic, why, and also when 
properties have been surveyed and found not to be historic, which is equally important for our kind of day-to-day -day work. Um, the goal is to have that be part of the what's called the property information portal or something that's going to be on the city website. Um, that's the part that's not up yet. So we'll make a big deal about that once it's up. We'll give you a live demonstration. We'll try to get the word out to everyone. So that's, that's very exciting. Is that being done internally or outside? Yeah, it's being done internally. Eileen Babahani, who was promoted to an assistant planner position, so you're not going to see her here with us as much as you have in the past, but she'll definitely be presenting for, um, for historic-oriented properties that might come before you. Um, she did a tremendous amount of work on that, so we're really grateful for that. And uh, but that should be con finished in the first half of the year, I would guess. It's really close. Um, we also need to establish, um, then this also goes to council, the interim review policy for um, properties or uh, historic districts that are nominated. And that, that became an issue when the House on Valley View was kind of in play. And we need to write the code, the ordinance uh, recommendations. Uh, we had an intern do some studies of what other jurisdictions do. We have to kind of complete that work because he's no longer here. Um, and again, that should go to council this year. Uh, we will complete the commercial survey, as I mentioned. The historic district brochure that, as of now, is called Living in a Historic District, a guide for residents. Maybe we'll get a juicier title for that. Um, that is also almost ready to go. will definitely be out this year, and I know I've said that that's been in process for a while. Really close. And... I, I forget, are we seeing a draft of that or only once it's published? Um, I don't know. Did we promise a draft? I don't remember where that is. Requested you can now. I don't see any reason why not. But I thought we shared a draft some months ago. No. 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 I don't remember that. About it, but I could put that on the agenda for upcoming meeting. Yes. That would be Please. great. The last thing in our goals is to complete the South Glendale Community Plan, which also is on schedule. There's not much um, on schedule for this year, Mr. Lewis. Yeah, our goal is to have it in front of City Council for adoption by the end of the calendar year, which means we'll probably be in front of commissions for commission input um, probably late, mid to late summer. So on your end, just like with the North Glendale Community Plan, the historic context will be appended to that, and then aspects of the information in that in the historic context is kind of woven in through the document so that preservation things are not left behind when we're thinking about other kinds of planning uh, thoughts for the future of South Glendale. We and submitted, um, we looked at and commented on the North Glendale Plan. I, I know yeah. we did mm -hmm. that. Um, you also look, yeah, you looked so at the context those, and the plan. Those comments are incorporated in in some way or? What? Yeah, I don't remember. It's a while. I don't remember you having huge comments on the context. And then the plan kind of brings, for example, one of the big things we found was like this, the, the river stone walls and chimneys in, in North Glendale are really important to residents. So we made sure in the design guideline part of the North Glendale community plan to include that. So those are the kinds of things that get woven in. Well, I, I do remember that one of my comments was on the written commentary that I submitted that my concern was that the way the plan is written, it's in a very narrative style. And I had some concerns, which would apply to the South Glendale plan, too, about how one over the years follows up on the progress that's being made to maintain the historic character of the area that's been defined and how you check through it because, you know, there's no, not necessarily any historic memory there. I mean, there could be, but, you know, people change and that's a document that lasts for a long time. And so the structure of how one would look back on that and see how we're doing to maintain the plan, mm -hmm. that was, you know, something that came up in discussion and in writing. And I'm not with any planning document. There's a point where it's used to guide things as we move forward. 
It's used on a case-by-case -case basis to say, okay, how does this project that we're looking at right now fit into the community plan? Mm -hmm. We use the community plan for North Glendale all the time when we're working on projects in North Glendale. And also our citywide design guidelines and the guidelines in the community plans overlap to a great degree. So these documents do guide our daily thinking about how to move forward. But we don't, at this point, and I'm not sure I can even visualize how we would have kind of a tracking system since, mm. you know, we, we deal with projects just as they come in. We don't really have control of where these things are happening. So we just want to make sure that when they happen that we're analyzing them according to the best kind of document that we have. Any thoughts on that? Well, when it comes to, I mean, with the North Glendale plan, there was not any sort of statistical benchmarks that one could use to sort of measure from where the plan began when it was adopted to, say, 10 years down the road, mm -hmm. how much development had occurred or not occurred or how many parks have been built or not built. Um, the plan didn't include any sort of statistical things that are easy to track from that perspective. Uh, and I don't think we'll have... We'll probably have a little bit more in that direction on the South Glendale plan because we're kind of learning from our experience in developing these. Um, but I'm fairly certain we're probably not going to arrive at a point where the South Glendale plan has a goal to generate a certain amount of something. Uh, no, I mean just but, to if if there's a historic context and there are you know properties and areas listed as being of historic character and of interest in preserving. Um, we would want to revisit that. Oh, right. and, yeah. And what, one thing that we have done, on, on some cases at least, if not all of them, is when specific properties are identified in the report, right. um, we've put holds on them in our system just to kind of put that extra kind of point to prevent permits from being issued without taking sure. these issues into consideration. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. We would have had, oh. for instance, the South Glendale plan is an example that I always think of that's my favorite example is the Cedar Harvard area which if there had been a plan back then there would still be a craftsman neighborhood well, there. We so have to remember plans are different from surveys. A plan does not identify and specifically say that this property is important and that what, what a context does is it helps um, it's the backbone of future surveys so the commercial survey is going to use the historic South Glendale context and the North Glendale context as kind of the backbone for what's important right. in the community. So surveys and contexts kind of go hand in hand, just like for a historic district, we do the historic research part, the narrative part of it is what we call the context, and then we have the actual survey. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's probably, I should have mentioned it, that's probably the most important thing that's going to happen. Um, and if we ever have a citywide survey, We'll ultimately have four neighborhood contacts. We're going to do an East Glendale, West Glendale, North and South. And when we do a citywide survey, if those are completed, then we'll have a really solid uh, survey to, to work with. Yeah, if, if I may elaborate a little bit, too, I think the commercial corridor survey or any survey does give you a kind of a benchmark of properties that you know, can be then sort of resurveyed to determine to what degree there's been change or, or not, uh, or whether resources have been lost or modified. Um, you know, and as we kind of digitize all this information into the databases, it makes it easier to do these kind of database queries that when I started here 10 years ago, everything was in paper binders on a shelf, and it was pretty difficult to kind of do that kind of um, research. Um, so to the extent that it will have some survey data as part of the South Glendale plan, we'll have information that we can measure. Um, I do want to say, though, that um, in terms of neighborhood character, because the community plans do identify pretty significantly neighborhood character, either existing to be maintained and or kind of perpetuated or transformed into some sort of new character as a matter of city policy, to a large extent that is in com executing that is incumbent upon the various design review commissions or planning commission, and in many cases um, for smaller scale work, city staff, on a project by project basis. Um, so, you know, except for historic districts and designated properties, of course, the historic commission doesn't see much work, but the design review board 
really has the responsibility on a case-by-case basis to sort of say this project is in compliance or consistent with the community plan or the term that's often used as compatibility. And so that the design review board is a publicly appointed body kind of as the gatekeeper in many ways for that. And to the lesser extent, planning commission and city staff. But in Glendale, design review board is kind of the primary sort of keeper, watch keeper on that. Um, and as the community plans develop and uh, neighborhood characters articulated more clearly than it is today, it'll be uh, easier for them to do their job in that respect. So. Okay, so that's everything. And I'll make uh, the revisions. We'll send a revised version up to Sacramento. Are you taking any? Um, we, we do have one oral oh, communication. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize. And, and I. I don't know about the rest of the commissioners if they have any questions or comments. I have some comments and maybe others do. So should we do the oral communication yeah, and then, and then we'll your comment? Okay, so come on up, Kathy. Thank you. Um, I'm now here again on behalf of the Glendale Historical Society. Um, we're pleased by several aspects of the report, um, especially that the historic resources survey of all commercial and industrial zones is moving forward, and that the city is emphasizing education in the standards, and um, board members plan to attend those meetings. Um, we are, of course, delighted that six properties were added to the Glendale Register, and our thanks again go to um, Chairwoman Vidor for her leadership in nominating city properties. Um, as you know, we try to work as closely as we can uh, with HPC and staff to preserve and manage changes to Glendale's historic resources. We note that a goal listed for next year is to improve relationship with the Glendale Historical Society. We appreciate the spirit of cooperation demonstrated here, and we want to uphold it as well. We were confused, though, by the further comment that our criticism, quote, often reflects views that sharply diverge from policies developed over many years and with community input that predate the participation slash residency of current TGHS board members. This remark struck us as irrelevant and a mischaracterization of board members' knowledge of and years of service on behalf of these policies. For example, Vreg Mardian, a Glendale resident of four decades, was on the HPC when the Historic District guidelines were adopted, and he has insisted repeatedly that any interpretation that treats them as helpful suggestions rather than as directives to homeowners is not at all what the HPC intended. We have heard the same thing from some of the volunteers who worked to create the guidelines, um, such as John Lacascio, a former a president of TGHS and a current commissioner. Our objection to this comment may seem trivial, um, but we think that it obscures the point of what we're trying to do. Um, we do seek to preserve historic resources, but more urgently, to make sure the city follows the proper process in its treatment of them. And we don't see how the duration of one's residence in Glendale has anything to do with arguments against violations of CEQA. Um, we would ask that you strike that sentence from the report. Um, the board does welcome improved uh, uh, communication and education, and perhaps TGHS and the city um, can partner to invite staff from the Office of Historic Preservation to do a workshop uh, workshop on CEQA. Um, a couple of specific things about the report as well. We did not know that staff um, were seeking to create a new status code for historic district contributors in surveys. This is unnecessary, and we urge the HPC to oppose it. Currently, the city uses the California Historical Resources Status Codes, which is absolutely typical for contributors. These status codes identify contributors as, quote, recognized as historically significant by local government with with different categories depending on the property. Uh, we're concerned that changing the status code so that contributors may not be identified as historically significant by the local government might make it easier to alter them radically or demolish. Um, and we just don't think it's possible that a new status code invented by Glendale would better mesh with CEQA, as the report claims, than those that were created by the state of California itself. Um, lastly, we also ask um, that the city do what it says it does in the report, i.e., that all work that doesn't meet the historic district guidelines 
quote, must be heard by HPC at a public hearing. Um, for example, we don't understand how it meets the guidelines if staff can decide that a surveyed character-defining feature such as diamond pane leaded glass windows um, that were removed without a permit are, that, these, that this feature is not coming back. Please don't let your authority be usurped. Uh, residents of Glendale rely on you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if anybody has any comments on anything related to the certified local government report. Um, I have none. None? No, I do. Um, I also, my first comment was I, you know, again, maybe it's another scary memory slip, but I didn't remember uh, a new status code. Uh, being discussed, so yeah, it's been discussed with uh, Shippo directly, and we can agendize a discussion of that. We can't really do that now, but just just in brief, we Shippo's already approved a code. The the status codes, and this is recognized by others in the field, the status codes don't do a great job for historic district contributors. And when we talk about this, I could explain what what that issue is. And the city's policy about historic district contributors is a divergence from the historical societies, and that's one of the issues that was referenced in that part of the sentence that uh, that was questioned. And this is going back before my time, so this is knowledge that's come forward through through our staff uh, regarding that process. Um, but yeah, we all, I can definitely put that on the next agenda. It would be a 7 DC code, 7 district contributor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the idea that the properties would would uh, lose their historic character is, is completely not what this goal, goal is. But this mm -hmm. goal is to allow our codes to mesh with CEQA in a better way. Okay, so that'll be agendized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Um, I also um, had, oh, on uh, 7D15, just, you know, this was a wording thing, just in terms of beefing up the Mills Act to, you know, maybe elaborate in a longer sentence about what that meant, like strengthening the Mills Act to track owner accountability for commitments better, something like that, because beefing up didn't quite nail it for me. Um, it and was then late. Um, what, what page is that, that on page 15? page 15, yeah. <laughs> and tell me exactly where that is. Oh, um, 7D. It's in D and... Almost the last bullet tray. Uh, okay, bring proposal to beef up Mills Air contracts through increased number. Okay, I can yeah. reword that. So. Okay, and then on the point, the uh, 7E, page 15, about, you know, the issues with the relationship with the historical society... I, I can understand some of um, the concerns that were raised, and it. I had a little trouble grasping, you know, maybe the wording for this report doesn't need to be changed. I don't know. But it seems to me that we're talking about a very kind of vast generalization of there's disagreement and maybe different interpretations of what the policies and practices of the city are and what the community wants. And I believe that in your explanation, you said taking the step to meet with the board and mate of the historical society. And that seemed, in, when you look at how serious an issue this is, that we all want to understand, be up to date mm -hmm. on those things, it almost seemed like it was like ex parte communication, like we're going to get together with, you know, this group of people and straighten it out. And I think it actually... Um, I'd, I'd like to know what my fellow commissioners think, but it almost needs like a public workshop or maybe study session to have not only yourself and the um, board of the Historical Society at the table, but us, too. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, even though several of us have been on the commission for a while and think we're talking about a long period of time in which policies and practices have evolved, so let's just all make sure we're all on the same page, mm -hmm. because there has been disagreement at times and some confusion, and rather than just 
squaring things away with the historical society, can we make it a broader audience? Uh, no, for that's this? that's a great idea to yes. do that. The, this this comment was specifically intended for Shippo oh, to right. reflect discussions that the city's had with Shippo and TJHS has had with Shippo. So there's recognition in their office that there are issues between us and but and but there is room for healthy debate in preservation and there's no no goal of having everyone be on the same page because that's never going to happen and sh shouldn't happen I would say you know there's some obvious situations where yes we can all celebrate a historic district but there are judgments and differences of, of opinion and I think that's very healthy but you know I, I stand behind what I wrote I probably shouldn't have written it in that way I was thinking more in terms of this being read by Shippo not that I was trying to hmm. hide it hide it at all I wanted to be upfront about it so um, and it wasn't to get us all to agree on everything we but it seemed like there may be information that is relevant to the entire community or anybody any interested parties and certainly would be interesting to the commissioners as maybe even as an issue of training just to come up to date on what the policies are mm -hmm. and the practices that we're talking about here. Well, and I, I think since Kathy mentioned that the members of the board plan to be here for these SHPO kind of slide presentations we're going to go through, what, the way I picture those happening is that we will have an opportunity to discuss. We can stop the slideshow and answer questions, talk about it, talk about differences okay. of interpretation, if there are any, and, and, and see where the commission comes in on that. Ultimately, you know, <laughs> yeah. yes, ultimately it's, it's really going to help everyone it's to kind of like get a this. So. four-day workshop at a hotel. It's <laughs> such a long yeah. meeting. Um, but it, no, but, but they're, they're brief. They're, if, we, if we just cruise through them, they're about half hour, 45 minutes. Yeah. And I'll talk more about that okay. at the end. And so. I, I think the issue on page 14, 7A, which is the thing about people in the community um, being concerned about development. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a specific historic preservation piece to that that we're referring to here. I mean, there are general concerns about development and setbacks and density and all that, but we're talking about one specific aspect yeah, th of th development. Thankfully, you don't deal with traffic. And yeah, yeah, right. I'm, and <laughs> I'm very pleased. But, you know, maybe that aspect um, could be folded in to the discussion because, you know, the question is, um, how does the development of our downtown and some of the things that have happened when the economy started to pick up, how is that impacting historic preservation? I mean, that's the issue on the table here. It's not all those other things. Mm -hmm. So maybe that could get folded in with the other one on, you know, fi on page 15 about the policies and practices and misunderstandings or, or disagreements, because that's, that's also a relevant issue that... I think falls under the umbrella of what you're talking about with the historical society. Mm -hmm. And I think with this, to, to start that discussion about any kind of workshop or something, we have quarterly meetings um, with the director of CDD and planning staff. Um, so that would be a good opportunity to see how, how we could move forward with something like that. Okay, so I have um, a few changes, a few direction, a few directions for future consideration, and and then I just oh uh, status code. So and then I'll agendize a discussion about status codes in general, which I don't think the commission is too familiar with. So it could be helpful just as a basic introduction or refresher, mm -hmm. and then we'll talk about the specific issues that we're raising with Shippo. Okay. Thank you very much for the report. Um, so, are we ready to go on to item 8C, HPC, you're in review? Okay, we have a few slides to show you because we only designated three properties this year. It'll be a little faster. But uh, we'll see what comes in the next year. So, basically, the goal here is just to remind the public and the commission, you know, some of the achievements over the years, the concrete achievements like districts and Glendale Register designations, Mills Act contracts, etc. Um, I'm sure you remember all of these well. This is the uh, Jess Willard House on Blanchard Drive in, uh, in the Verdugo Woodlands, and City Council voted unanimously to designate this property 
I think they especially enjoyed the uh, Jess Willard connection. So in case you don't remember, heavyweight champion Jess Willard um, lived in the house. And you see what happens to heavyweight champions down at the left side there. <laughs> but here he is standing in front of the house. And the, uh, I talked to the homeowner the other day, and they're very excited. There's, you know, sometimes you put conditions on a Mills Act, and people are like, okay, I'll do that. And they are thrilled about restoring the stained glass uh, or the leaded glass at the front of the house. So we'll be working with them on that in the near future, I got the sense. Um, here's one of our city-owned properties uh, that Commissioner Vidor championed, uh, Adam Square Gas Station, looking pretty great, and it looks... We should have, and I don't know, Arlene, if you've kept um, a visual record of all the different art installations in there. Well, I mean, those art installations, uh, the last three and the upcoming next one are all city-sponsored mm -hmm. Arts and Culture Commission ones, so we have those, and we do have uh, pictures of the other ones. Yeah, if you, if you could share, do. I think it would be nice to have in the file a record of yeah, how this building has yeah. been used we, since it was designated. Pull those together. Yeah, because um, it's it's kind of an exciting process. When we brought this to City Council, which found it eligible as architecture and also as early heritage with, for car culture, um, we wanted to emphasize the community excitement and the community involvement in this one. So it makes it seem even more relevant that it's a city-owned property with so much support from the neighborhood. So we showed them this before picture when, when everyone was trying to save it. And then here, here's the group after. Um, so a lot of your Adams Hill friends and preservation people out there. Really fierce. And by the way, they, the, the Adams Hill Neighborhood Association is interested in having kind of a celebration when the plaque becomes available, which would include dressing up the station mm -hmm. like what was done when the park opened. With the gas pumps and With everything. the gas pumps and the cars and the whole bit. So um, something will happen and maybe the city will get involved in that. Well, we'll, we'll so. definitely be involved in the plaque, so <laughs> that will be coming soon. So. Here is the uh, Paterka house, the, uh, the cool mid-century house up on Adams Hill also. Um, I believe... I don't want to speak. I don't remember that this was a unanimous vote at council. Mm. Yeah, I think it might have been a 4-1 vote. So, um, but that doesn't matter. It was designated, and, and that, that's ultimately what we care about. Um, both the, uh, the Willard House and the Paterka House, uh, we submitted uh, Mills Act uh, nominations for those houses. Um, which got in in time, and so everything's moving forward with their Mills Act uh, applications. Just so the commission knows, we uh, after we record them with the county, we send a copy to SHPO, which I guess has giant filing cabinet somewhere. We send a copy to the owner, and most importantly, we send one to the assessor's office, which is what begins their process of the reevaluation of the property. And the owners typically receive the first, they notice it on their October tax bill. Of, of the year that we submit it. So uh, the Mills Act program has kind of a year lag from the year that things are designated. And then finally, you can't forget the, uh, the <laughs> rehabilitation of the Masonic Temple. Um, I included it here just to remind you that this, this Mills Act application was approved by City Council. Um, we, the work is, as, as I know, it, it hasn't been completely done. But the commission put several conditions on the Mills Act, which all, all of which were approved by council, which are going to make sure that we have a second chance to look at the building um, after all of the work is done and evaluate whether or not it meets the expectations of the commission and the drawings that were approved. And if there is any divergence, we're going to work with the ownership to make it not diverge. And if there's any issues with that, then we'll bring it back to, to the commission. So so that okay. remains to be seen. Can I interject on this one? I didn't get invited to the, this particular tour, but I heard about it secondhand that Rick Caruso and the head of CBRE, who's the major tenant of the building, I forget his name, and the city manager were touring the site on January 3rd, the day after CBRE moved in on their deadline. Um, 
which I have to say is a pretty impressive logistical feat for the, regardless of what uh, anybody might think about the sort of our architectural character of the building and the work that was done, the fact that it was done in literally nine months is pretty impressive. Um, but in any event, uh, those three gentlemen were touring the facility and the head of CBRE and Rick Russo both acknowledged to the city manager that it was a tremendous effort by everybody involved in Glendale city staff and the commission as uh, well um, to get this building to the point where it opened on their time frame. And they said that it would have been impossible to do this in Los Angeles or even Burbank. And, you know, what they're remembering is the building inspectors who were doing sign-offs on Christmas Eve, um, but there's plenty of staff, and the city manager acknowledges that there was a lot of work done in May and April to make that possible to have inspections on Christmas Eve. So um, we've been sort of communicated, it's been communicated through the staff that, that the hard work that went into making this renovation possible and the time frame that... Caruso had sort of identified as much appreciated, and I think the commission can take a lot of credit for having helped this project get to a point where the building is now open and has life in it, um, which is kind of amazing and <laughs> after it so is. many years Did being we get a walk vacant. I, I'm quite certain we can arrange for walkthroughs and tours. I'm, I have a feeling they're going to want to trumpet this building quite a bit. I've already seen a number of articles in the paper and news journals, et cetera, about the renovation, so. Yeah, the st staff here who's arranging walkthroughs has heard that you knows that you would be interested. They're arranging a staff walkthrough. I'm not sure if, if we could include the commission on that or, of, co of course, we have to do Brown Act stuff on things like that. But since we only have four, we could have two of you, <laughs> two tours, so we might be able to work that out. But, uh, yeah, that's definitely going to be an offer at some point, sooner than later, I'd say. So those were our designations and, and Mills Acts for the year. Um, and then to end this section, we always, each year we go through the Mills Act fulfillments to make sure that we're staying on top of all of the conditions that have been imposed by the commission and give you a chance to have a look and, and make sure that they're as expected. Um, this is a subtle one. I don't know if you remember the Tudor House 611 Cumberland Road. The issue here was that the commission thought that these garage doors were inappropriate to the house. Um, the design team found an early sketch of garage doors, which we hadn't seen previously. And these are a close replication, not 100 percent. They're also roll-up doors instead of hinged mm -hmm. doors. But uh, staff felt that this very closely looked like the original drawing. We have no idea if it was built that way or not, but we can guess and say that this is appropriate. And this also, in a fairly simple design, could serve as a model for other kind of Tudor Revival garage doors in the future if, if someone's kind of shopping around for different looks if they have to replace their doors. Did, did the staff find that in the original, like, permit? Set of drawings? No, the, the owner came forward with it, and the, the, oh, des, the designer, and it was just a little, it, was, it wasn't an architectural drawing, it was literally kind of a sketch. Mm -hmm. So we were happy to work with that, and the owner agreed to do that. Um, 211 West Kenneth Road. I, I believe what happened in this case, these, this, this was, uh, we gave an extension for the work on this property. Uh, all of the work was supposed to be. Uh, completed by 2014, but it was a fairly extensive amount of work, so we gave them a year's extension. Um, I talked to the owner who says all of the work was done, but they actually expanded their own scope of work, and she wanted to have the photos of the work when it's all done. So I will show those to you as soon as I get them, either February or March hearing. I'll, I'll, I'll just share those with you. But what was really exciting was we were able to, we, we didn't know what to do with the Faubois waterfall and bridge and walkways. And the, if you remember, there was a tree, a Faubois concrete tree that had a lamp post on the top and a little branch sticking out with a concrete bird on it. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a pretty exciting discovery. And for me, this is, I, I just have a personal love of this material. Um, we didn't know who to recommend to do the work. And finally, I tracked down this guy, Terry Egan who's done all of the work at the Huntington, and the Huntington has probably the most extensive amount of this material that I've seen. So uh, they hired him to do the work, and he gave me a very excited phone message about how excited he was about the finished product. So I'll get a lot of photos and show those to you when we have them. 
1411 North Central is the uh, Spanish house that was on one of the TGHS tours. I'm sure you remember this one. And the commission had several conditions put on this. Um, if you remember on the back side of the house facing kind of a rear courtyard, there was this mysterious door to nowhere. We assume there was a, a balcony terrace up there at some point, but it's long gone. But the commission didn't like the way this looked. Uh, if you remember, there, there had been a closet built behind this area, and that's why it was. you can sort of see the back side of the wall that was built there. Um, the owners removed that closet, um, uh, refinished the doors and windows, put, I don't know if, I think they had to put some new glass in, I'm not sure. But basically, it's still a door to nowhere, it's still a bit of a mystery, but it looks a lot better than it did. And it will be kept up as when the rest of the house gets painted over the years. This will stay uh, looking as good as it does now, hopefully. Um, there was a window air conditioning unit in this window, also kind of at the back of the house. Uh, that was removed. A uh, pane of glass had been taken out to allow for that, so the glass it was reglazed. Um, these are photos that just show an example, but there, were, there was some sloppy painting and there was also some damaged wood at various places. So the wood was repaired, and these areas were repainted for doors and window sills. And most interestingly, I believe it was Commissioner Vidor who caught that, what are these metal things on the side of the house? And we suggested that they might be exterior um, uh, draperies, solar drapes. And so the idea was that we would um, try to bring those back. And I can't remember if at the hearing we had the thought or if it was after the hearing because we have another, this was designed by Ben Sherwood, the architect, and we have another house on Cordova designed by Ben Sherwood. And I can't remember if it was at the hearing or afterwards we kind of said, let's go look at the other Ben Sherwood. Sure enough, solar drape rods and, and brackets, the same shape as the ones that were on the house. So it gave us an idea of what the proportions were and how they would look. So the couple uh, restored the solar brackets on this window, this window, and you can't even see this window. And unfortunately, with all this foliage, you can't, we don't have a good picture of this. But it pretty much is based on the, the other house on Cordova. So that's back. And we were comfortable that they met all of their uh, conditions. Uh, the Brockman House, Brockmont on Arbor. Uh, had several conditions placed on it with kind of a staggered time frame. Um, the owners restored all of the cast iron lamp posts, which is basically sandblasting some of the paint off them, repainting them, and a number of them had missing globes, so the globes were replaced. And then these concrete um, light, light uh, posts on the stairs and down at this terrace also had some missing globes, I think, so all of those were replaced. We did an inspection of this, um, I think a couple of months ago we were out there. If you remember, the little statue of Mercury was in pieces. Uh, a condition was made to restore Mercury to his whole condition and to place him somewhere appropriate. This photo doesn't really show it. This is kind of a little side patio next to the house. It's not a super prominent location. We have historic photos showing it in a couple of different places over time, so we didn't have like one place where it should go. So what they did was place it down this kind of narrow patio, so it's kind of on axis at the back, kind of the dead end of the patio, and it looked pretty sharp. And then they did something clever. They didn't have a base for it, and I don't know if you remember, but all of these sort of Chinese-shaped terracotta pieces were kind of scattered around the site and used in different ways. So they picked one of those up and used it as the base for this, which has no Greek or Roman heritage, but I thought for the site it was kind of a fun way to do it and thought that was appropriate. There was a vinyl fence here to screen the AC units. Um, they put this metal fence up, not one way or the other, but, but the condition was to remove the vinyl fence. Obviously they didn't want to just have the, uh, the uh, compressors exposed. So they put this up with a mesh. Um, we were relatively okay with it. It's on the back, kind of the far side of the house, and the house is completely invisible to anyone who isn't invited to the property. Um, I probably would have painted it, but sometimes when you paint metal like this, it starts looking bad. So I was relatively okay with this. Um, 
And finally, uh, it's hard to see in the photos, but there were a bunch of kind of spalls in the concrete and cracks in the concrete. And they had someone come, and you, when, you're, when you're looking at it closely, you can see the fill areas, and the color was a good match and, and seemed appropriate. That Oh, and then finally, um, there was a condition to replace windows. They have until the end of this year, I think. Let me just double check that. Yeah, they, they, oh, actually, they have until 2017. Um, but we did meet with the window company a couple of months ago, and we haven't seen any drawings yet, but they're uh, basically going to replace this slider window, which is on the back of the house, and then these two uh, infills at the base where the garage of the clock tower used to be. And we don't know what the original windows were on this tower. I'm guessing they would have been divided lights, but these are, the f these are what we see in the earliest photos from an old news press article. So we, rather than kind of make something up, we decided to just let the new windows down here kind of reflect this style, which when you look at it, looks okay. Um, if we ever got documentation in the future, what it looked like, and they had to replace the new windows in the future, we would be able to bring it even closer. Um, but this, they'll, they'll have uh, French doors down here and taller um, casement windows in this opening. And then finally, we have 804 Kenneth Road, which has been a long saga that the commission is very familiar with. Um, the fountain in question <laughs> is sitting on the side of the house. We met with the owners and their representative uh, in November and came up with two directions, one to restore the fountain to working condition and the other to get rid of the fountain, which they convinced me and I believe they convinced the commission that this doesn't look like an original feature, that it was added at some point, we don't know. Um, there were issues that were raised toward the end of the commission hearing that if this were created as a flat pad, there's a drop off on this side and then it might have led to railings or I'm not, maybe there could have been steps there, I'm not sure. Um, but regardless, they decided to go with the fountain uh, aspect. And this is going to be a tough one, I think, for you, some of you, if not all of you, because the condition is written, and, as, and I've gone through the tape, the condition was to restore the fountain to working order. And I know there was a goal of aesthetic enhancement um, to bring more tile work and anything else into this. But they, they've taken this at the letter of, of the condition and the, the statements at the hearing. And this basin, this half basin, was created to hide the electrical outlet that was in the wall. And we don't know when that was there. Luckily, they were able to disguise it. This is centered, it's symmetrical, it's balanced. And there is a bubbler here. And they did fix the, uh, the existing sprinklers in the basin. And my, my recommendation to the commission is I, I believe that this meets the condition as it was written and said at the hearing. I, I think the lesson from this is when, when, we're, when I'm hearing conditions and when you're presenting conditions, to really make sure that we've got the full picture of what the commission is expecting. Because we don't, on staff level, we don't care. But once a condition's written, and this is true of DRB also, we basically are bound by the com by that condition and expect that to be done. So, you know, I'm curious to hear what what the commission thinks, but but I'm not sure that legally we're standing on firm ground asking this to be aesthetically restored when it's not necessarily even a historic feature. So. so. Well, I think it's. <laughs> horrendous quite <laughs> quite honestly could you write that down <laughs> um i mean yeah lesson learned i think we also have to weigh into who is the homeowner because when homeowners are bringing us properties for historic designation and maybe have the mills act but tax benefits in mind yet don't want to restore the property or preserve it or beautify it or bring it back to what it might have been then we probably do need to go into a much more level of detail on what we mean by restore to a functioning fountain. I mean, most people knowing the, the scale and grandeur of this Spanish style house would have typically had a beautiful water feature with a nice tile work and, mm -hmm. you know, your typical Spanish fountain or something. So right. for people who aren't looking either to spend the money, want the tax break, 
and don't really necessarily care that much about the property, then you're right. We probably need to go to specify exactly and, and, what it is that we're picturing. And I, w I would say for all homeowners, because we can't yeah. really judge who does or doesn't, you know, care about the historic right, character and just wants the tax it's break. It's become very clear. Well, this to, to the owner that this this house received a much smaller tax reduction than any other similar house in the entire program, mm -hmm. and I have no idea why that was. Um, I believe it's still on the market, but I'm not sure. But again, that shouldn't be the, the purpose. The purpose should be for the preservation of the property, well, of course, regardless yeah. of any savings. Of course. Um, yeah, and but yeah, lesson learned. Yeah. You know, for for every owner, and I think I think the commission's pretty good at this. This was this was several years ago. This was it's 2011. Like they've missed every single deadline. Mm -hmm. Like they haven't, they haven't kept their word. I know it's, it's a sore subject. I, but all I think all we can hope is that the new homeowners, because the property is up for sale, will do this place justice, and mm -hmm. we'll, you know, obviously we should probably have a meeting with them. You know, so that they're aware or they get the brochure finished <laughs> quickly. So they well, the brochure is intended for they, district owners. That's true. Yeah, so. But just so that they understand, you know, for future changes that, mm -hmm. you know, there is a level of quality we expect, and this isn't it. Right. Yeah. Generally, when we when we hear that a Glendale Register property is on the market, I call the realtor to make sure they understand that, do their due diligence, and I explain to them if if it doesn't have the Mills Act, that that's an option. Or tell them what the Mills Act means for their for the future owners of the property, but I don't hear about every house that's on the market and every transaction. So I have gotten calls from the Historical Society and I think from some commissioners over time that when you see the for sale sign, I'm happy to do the footwork to kind of uh, just talk to the realtors and make sure they understand. And even that doesn't mean that they understand. So you know we we do do our best on that and I, I agree that this is not the ultimate <laughs> solution to this problem I, I I just couldn't find a way to argue that it didn't meet the, the condition as we presented it so and I believe I ended not on that note I ended on a somewhat more positive note <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> on the same house we're not ending on that here here's here's this fantastically horrible awning and the hole in the wall that had the fan the awning is gone and they put a vent pipe for the kitchen duct and they painted it out to match the wall and they filled the holes to you know, so you don't see a trace of the uh, former awning. And this is very exciting for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. That's the end of our show tonight. The end. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Very interesting report. And I think um, we have one more item. Item 9 has to do with e-learning. Oh, uh, yeah. So can you So I've, I've already I've already tape? kind of given that one away. Um, when I was part of discussions I've been having recently with, with the woman who's in charge of the local government unit at the state office, and we were talking about trying to get better educational opportunities for the commission and for you guys to have easier ways to take advantage of them, uh, she mentioned that they have these learning modules, which I had heard about years ago but never knew that they were up and running and sitting on their website. Um, they've, they're looking at the Secretary of the Interior standards and also the four treatments for properties, which are restoration, rehabilitation, reconstruction, and preservation. Um, most of our work focuses on rehabilitation, but it's important for everyone to understand that there are these different levels of intervention that can be made on properties. So they've divided it into three sections. Um, the first introduction is about 15 or 20 minutes. It's basically a narrated slideshow. So what I, what I, the way, way I picture this going is we'll just start the slideshow. We'll all listen together with whoever's in the audience. Um, and then it might be easiest to possibly stop when we're talking about very specific subjects, to stop the show, answer questions, rather than waiting to the end, which we normally do if someone's speaking to us. Um, but the commission, we can kind of play that by ear and see what's comfortable. Um, my thought was that the first one's 15 or 20 minutes, the second one I think is 30-ish minutes. I thought we could probably do those together. The first one's the intro, the other one talks about the four treatments. And then the third module, which is a bit longer, focuses on the standards themselves, 
So I thought having that as kind of a separate session instead of just trying to cram it all into one evening. Um, so I'm open to any thoughts that you have. Um, at this point, we might be, we don't have anything ready to go for February as of now. So there's a chance we would cancel the February meeting. If we do that, we would come back in March with the brochure, <laughs> hopefully for review. Plus we could do the, these learning modules. Um, could we do the learning modules in February? We could, um, if you want to have a hearing that, I, I wouldn't be at that hearing, but that's okay. Alan has said that he could cover it. Um, we generally prefer to take your time out when we have items on the agenda. And since we're routinely here for a couple of hours, I thought if we spent an hour talking about the e-learning and if we had a nomination or something else, or the brochure uh, for discussion, that would be kind of a standard hearing. But if the commission wants to do it in February, we can do that also. I think it would be nice to, Alan, I hope you don't take this wrong, to have both of you here. <laughs> Um, I don't know how you feel about that. <laughs> well, I, you know, honestly, I have more I have more experience thinking about the standards than I think Alan does. But I probably but Alan could definitely cover it. So, but okay. Yeah, I mean, regardless of staff availability, because we will staff the commission as necessary to do business. But the um, other thought that we had is that generally we would, if we're going to hold a commission meeting, it's better if we actually have some business to conduct, action and votes, things for you to take votes on, as opposed to just holding a meeting for the sake of it because it's on the calendar and, well, we can fill the time with a learning module. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was that was kind of our thinking. Of, and, and who knows, maybe there will be a late nomination or something that could come up that we have to address in February. It's not unprecedented. Well, we yeah, we, we usually wait to the week before the hearing to cancel anyways, right. so if okay. something came up, we definitely... Okay, so we'll We can try one time. and see how it goes, yeah. right? And if it's, we'll like, too it. much with the business and the learning, we'll take it. sort of like the combined meeting years yeah. ago. Yeah. I think the but commitment <laughs> is that over the course of two or three months, we'll go through this, and it's something that we can repeat in the future. Um, the standards aren't something that just soak in automatically, right. and I think it's something practice helps with. We can also start, you know, we, we do, when we bring work proposals to you, we do an, anal an analysis based on the standards for, for the uh, work items, which is, we can talk more about that, but, uh, okay. so. and that's, that's it for the. I just have one quick question, and I know you need yeah, to no. go, but is there, sure. I think a few years ago we were told that there is no budget for us to be able, you know, for the city to be able to support or reimburse our attendance at out-of-town um, conferences, mm -hmm. and I'm just asking if there is any change to that. <laughs> well, as, as Jay mentioned, our some of our memberships are group or city memberships that give us discounts to assorted conferences. Uh, and kind of seminars. So um, that does allow us to sort of offer you reduced rates or kind of free rates for some events. Um, I think if you're interested in some sort of travel or kind of extended discussion or, or kind of extended travel or kind of fairly relatively expensive events, and you know, if, especially if it was an overnight thing. Um, we might have a capacity to do some limited reimbursement, but it'd have to be pretty precise. Um, uh, uh, let me double check kind of where we stand on, on that. Okay, that's good to know. I mean, because some of the bigger conferences are worth attending, but it can add yeah. up. And yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, I'm, we have limited reimbursement and kind of conference and travel budget for staff. Um, whether we can extend that to commissioners, not 100% sure what the procedures are on that. Okay. But I'll, we'll look into that. And let us know. The Thank next you. CPF conference is going to be held at the Presidio in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And so if you have Thanks. friends in the city and want to drive up, it might be a relatively affordable. There's SAH in Pasadena. SAH in Pasadena, which won't have any preservation focus. <laughs> but... <laughs> we, are, we are reprising the Brand Library um, panel that we had last year. Um, through the Society of Architectural Historians local chapter. The national chapter of SAH is coming to Pasadena in April, 
And so on April 10th, we are we're going to have the same panel discussion and then tour of the library for people coming from out of town to see what's going on in the area. So Glendale is, is going to have a what's that? Is that open for our attendance, or was that a? You'd probably have to pay for that. that that's still unclear. Uh, we, we're working it out between the library and SAH. I, I assume SA, most SAH events that they that their members are paying for, they don't want it to be freely available to the public. Um, so we're talking through the local SAH chapter. We're trying to figure that out. So, yeah. but if you crash, <laughs> just show up. Yeah. Society of Architectural Historians. Architectural Historians. Okay. 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 Well, I'm just dying to use this right. meeting adjourned. Nice. Cool. Thank adjourned you. at six thirty-two. Yes.